I thought I was a, a good drug addict. I'm like, hey, doctors prescribed this, so I'm okay. You know, I'm doing what people are prescribed every day. If I was to leave now, I wouldn't make it. I'd probably OD, I'd probably be one of the guys on the news. I don't need two weeks, a month sober. Like, I need a year sober before I can finally say, okay, now I'm like on the right path. The United States is dealing with a major public health crisis. Over the last decade, heroin-related overdose deaths have nearly quadrupled. The state of New Hampshire is the epicenter of this epidemic. It has the highest rate of young adults abusing opioids in the country. New Hampshire is struggling with how to deal with its opioid problem, namely how to provide its residents with drug treatment. It ranks second to last in the country for spending on substance abuse programs. So unless New Hampshire residents are able to pay thousands of dollars for private programs, they're stuck on months-long waiting lists, leaving them vulnerable to fatal overdoses. We've come to Serenity Place in Manchester, which is a rehab treatment facility that, unlike others, lets you in regardless of your financial situation. What's the most common substance that people come in and saying that they have a problem with? Um, heroin, by far. Yes, sir. And is that something that's gotten worse over the few years? Or I would say so. Um, the state of New Hampshire and really New England as a whole um, is experiencing quite the opiate epidemic, uh, but heroin has by far been the most um, common substance that we've seen our clients try to detox from and receive treatment for. How difficult it is generally for someone with a substance abuse issue to get treatment, whatever kind of treatment that is? Um, unfortunately, it's very difficult at this period of time. There's such a lack of awareness out there uh, amongst the general public, and there's um, an incredible lack of treatment that's available. And what's the situation right now? Do you have a waiting list or do you have some beds available? We do have a waiting list um, specifically this time of year. My rough estimation is that we're looking at about a handful of weeks. While getting access to drug treatment across the state is a major problem, one unlikely source is helping addicts get the care they need. It's the state prison in Berlin, New Hampshire. Here, 68 inmates are enrolled in one of the country's more intensive substance abuse treatment programs. They live on one block together, separated from the general population, have daily group therapy and one-on-one -on -one sessions with counsellors. The idea is to create a structured community with mandatory gym and therapy where these inmates are working together towards sobriety. I got out last October. I left this place with a Spoxin habit. So what's the next available thing? Go back to heroin and cheaper. Brian Champion is one of the participants in the drug treatment program. He first got sent to prison for stealing a marijuana plant from a frat house at a college in New Hampshire. This was classified as a home invasion and he was sentenced to a maximum of three years. He's back in prison now because he violated his parole on drug-related charges and was court ordered to come to Berlin for this drug treatment program. Brian's addiction really began in prison to deal with the stress of incarceration. He was abusing Suboxone, a medication originally intended to help opioid abusers slowly wean off drugs, but that is now widely abused by inmates. I'll never forget, I left Concord State Prison somewhat detoxing because I hadn't done Suboxone in a little while. And I'm supposed to enjoy this day. I just got done doing four years, finally with my wife, and I was kind of sick, and it yeah. sucked. And I remember my wife dropped me off at parole, and I was like, hon, I'm gonna walk home because our house was only like a few blocks away. I walked home, I stopped at the store, and I see an old friend. He had Suboxone, and so I took the Suboxone instead of the heroin, and that was it. Like, I had that connect, and I went straight right back to heroin, and I had syringes, and I took off running right then and there, and it was hard to come off. I was doing two to three grams of dope a day, plus a gram of coke, and not only do I think it's hard to just get help, but on the streets, there's a wait, you know, especially in New Hampshire. I tried to stop twice and go to detox or get help, and everybody said three months. Now, somebody trying to quit heroin, and somebody says, come back in a month or three months, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna keep using until then, you yeah. know what I mean? And I had to go to the hospital and tell them I was gonna kill myself just to get admitted into the hospital. Because when I detox, I'm a diabetic. My sugar goes sky high. Like, as soon as the doctor came back in, and she's like, I'm sorry, I have to release you. As much as I don't want to, I have to let you go. And I looked at her and I was like, I'm gonna kill myself. And she's like, what do you mean? And I told her, I was like, if you let me go, I'm gonna go find something to shoot. I don't care what it is. I'm gonna shoot it up, I'm gonna kill myself. And she looked at me and she goes, thank you for saying that. That's what I needed you to say. She couldn't tell me to say it, but she's like, I'm glad you said it. Changes everything. We'll that's get a, you admitted. It's so. a pretty damning indictment of the 
the <laughs> availability of, exactly. the, yeah. of the programs out there. Mm. If you're basically going to have to go to a doctor to say you, you'll kill yourself to mm. get treatment. Yep. The gentleman brought up the introduction. We're going to have a group meeting. Anybody that would like to participate in the group, come on downstairs, please. So this is the drug abuse treatment center inside the Berlin State Prison. And every day these guys go through some group therapy sessions. There's one about to take place now where they can talk about how the treatment's going and you know, what they're looking forward to and how they're working on helping themselves get themselves clean. Just touch base on what is a high risk situation for you as far as relapse. I would say my biggest relapse triggers would be um, big emotional changes or big, big things happening that I have no control of over in the streets, you know, family. Uh, for me, it would be like too much free time or extra money or like not not having a schedule, things to stick to. My you know, biggest trigger is being around negative people. You know, always want to complain about what's going on and like also I said boredom. I can't always sit there and occupy my time. So sometimes it's like, oh, well, I'm going to do this escape, you know, and feel good today. It's hard to stop by yourself, especially on the street or even in here when you're using every day and say you need to wait four months to get into somewhere, you can say, I want to go to the drug program. They'll put you in in a couple weeks. It's a lot easier to get in here. Half the people in prison don't really belong there. They're primarily nonviolent and mostly substance abusers. Dr. Harry Wexler was one of the first people to study drug treatment programs in prison. He discovered that these programs significantly slow down the revolving door of incarceration. The people who wind up in prison are those where all the institutions didn't work prior to prison. Education didn't work, social services didn't work, nothing worked outside, then there's this path into prison. One of the things that's an unexpected positive consequence is that when you get into trouble and you get into treatment, that can give you opportunities you wouldn't have had before. You have the benefits of the treatment from helping you in recovery and helping you reduce your recidivism rates. But the key is then when you leave prison, that's important. For some of you guys that might be getting out sooner on this program, are you worried about what might happen once you get out there and there is certainly no support for your, you know, your treatment and your, your process of getting off whatever you were using? But now I'm reaching to the end of my, my bid and I'm like, all right, well, I need to take the initiative and I need to learn coping skills. I need to learn what are my triggers. I need to learn all this stuff so when I go out there, I'm not out there, so to speak, naked with nothing. I like to see addiction as not a good or a bad thing, but as like a healthier, sick thing. This isn't my first time with treatment, but it is the first time I've seen inside of an institution them make an effort to help us get better instead of punishing us for something we were doing wrong. I mean, as a treatment provider, what I ask you all to do, I ask you all to feel the pain, to be sad, to feel all their emotions, instead of just taking your drug and get high. And I'm like, yeah, sign me up, right guys? You know what I mean? Getting sober is painful. It hurts. It's challenging. It's physically sick. It's emotionally sick. Um, every day is a challenge. Every hour. Some of you guys, it's one minute at a time. It's not one day at a time. Is that fair to say? Yeah. I get through that next minute. You guys talked about uh, structure and boredom. Boredom yeah. is the number one risk reason for relapse. Fair to say. So that's why here we try to push. You know, schedule yourself. You know, the mandatory child. At first, you guys were like, ah. But there's a reason for our madness. Well, the mandatory thing has helped because it forces you to go. And once you're there, you feel better about yourself. You know, and I, I do want to add on that I am concerned about when I leave here because I have multiple injuries back. I need both shoulders replaced. And usually opiates kick me back into relapse. And uh, I just need something more intense because in the past I've always relapsed back to uh, opiates and it's always put me back in prison. So this program here has huge potential. Um, I'm hoping that they get some more money in the budget because we can use a few more counselors, um, a lot more things, because um, there's guys here that really want it, I want it. How do you feel when now you're clean? I hate it sometimes, to be honest with you, but I love it. It's weird, I hate it, but I love it. Cause I have to deal with stuff, but I love it that I can deal with stuff with clean head. Now that I'm sober and stuff like that, I'm like, I wasted all these good things that I could have been doing and been like close to my wife 
and here I am, you know what I mean? So like, so all those feelings come back. Like, I'm glad I got them back. Like, I'm glad I can feel sometimes now that I'm not numb. Like, so if something's bothering me, I can talk about it. Given that the treatment access is still hard out there, mm -hmm. what are your feelings towards leaving this quite strict program to then suddenly going out and having no sort of regime? If I was no to leave now, I wouldn't make it. I'd probably OD, I'd probably be one of the guys on the news. There's no way I can make it right now. Because I know, no matter what, I need some type of long-term treatment program when I leave here. I don't need two weeks, a month sober. Like, I need a year sober before I can finally say, okay, now I'm like on the right path. Some of these inmates may end up serving the final portion of their sentences in a halfway house. These facilities usually only provide minimal support for drug users. My daughter's little. She doesn't want to sit in there no, more than no. five minutes. <laughs> so we come out here and play. Annick Sarantopoulos is in a woman's halfway house in Concord, New Hampshire. She became addicted to opioids after being prescribed Percocets for a year and a half following a shoulder injury. Her addiction escalated once the hospital cut off her prescription. Annick then bought pills on the street so she wouldn't get sick from withdrawing from the Percocets. She went from pills to heroin and then sold drugs to fund her habit. She eventually got caught and was sentenced to a maximum of four years in a women's prison. Annick is serving her last year in the halfway house before being released back into the community. How hard is it to stay clean and, you know, is the threat of relapse something that you're worried about? Yes, I am very worried about it because it's happened so many times. The relapse is one thing, is what comes after the relapse. A lot of the family members will get mad at you for relapsing and why didn't you ask for help and why this and why that? It's at the point in time when it's happening, you just don't want to disappoint them again. So you, well, for me anyway, I try to hide it the best I can. But for me, addiction, I lived through it as a kid. My father was an addict and I hated drugs. I wanted nothing to do with it. When it happened to me, I just could not believe it had happened to me. Knowing so much about it and having suffered through it as a kid, I could not wrap my head around that it happened to me. I really couldn't. Do you often look back you know, on, on your path to addiction from something that was just prescribed to you by a doctor, which you're not going to question? Do you look back and just go, yeah, I can't believe that yeah, that's what's happening. Every day, every day that I get up. And when I see my actions, I do the same thing to my child, what my dad did to me. And I remember exactly how I felt when I was a kid yeah. to my dad going to jail or my dad getting arrested or my dad being out partying. Once I realize what I'm doing and remember how I felt as a kid, I hit myself for it every day for doing it to her. She's my kid, she's my love, she's my life, she's everything. And I would never intentionally hurt her, but she suffered from my addiction a lot. Other women who've gone out there fully transitioned and from, if you've spoken to them, what's their experience of the support that's out there? And are you concerned about that or are you feeling pretty confident? Since I've been in, I've seen people come in, do their bid, leave and come back for a setback once, twice. So it is my concern that there's not enough out there because I would say 80% of the people either going back in with a new bid or coming back here for a setback. I feel like it's rough and I don't believe the support is there. The state is having a tough time supporting people who need drug treatment. New Hampshire can only serve 4 to 6% of young adults in need of care. This is due to a small tax base in the state of New Hampshire and to the sheer number of people who need treatment far outweighing the capacity of state funded facilities. Sadly, this treatment gap isn't something new, and it isn't only a problem in New Hampshire. For the past 50 years, only 10% of people who need drug treatment actually end up getting it across the United States. But today, with the historic rate of opioid-related deaths, people are paying more attention than ever to drug treatment, and it's becoming a topic all candidates are debating during the 2016 presidential election. When somebody is addicted and seeking help, they should not have to wait three, four months in order to get that help, they should be able to walk in the door tomorrow and get a variety of treatments that work for them. We have to do more on the prescribing end of it. There are too many opioids being prescribed and that leads directly now to heroin addiction. Why do you think New Hampshire has this problem? I just think everybody wasn't ready for opiates, the signs and stuff like that, because opiates, when you're on them, you can, you can be the greatest talker in the world, you know what I mean? You can connive anybody and everybody thinks that everything's fine until they really notice there's a problem when people are dying, people are robbing, people are stealing from each other, hurting each other, and then New Hampshire's like, oh, we well, might have a problem. 
As more and more Americans die from abusing opioids, programs in prison are often an addict's last hope for a clean future. With the chance to turn their incarceration into a shot at recovery, Brian and Anik might be some of the lucky ones. But drug treatment in prisons should only be a last resort. Unless we get drug offenders into treatment instead of prison, we will continue to needlessly criminalise drug users and will keep using prison as a band-aid rather than finding a long-lasting solution. Thank you.